What is myopic degeneration? What does it look like? How do you treat it? Well, stay tuned to find out. Remember to smash that like button and subscribe to my channel for more optometry related videos. You're watching I and I Optometry. So first we're gonna start here what a normal eye looks like. Remember, as light enters through the cornea into the lens, it will focus on the back part of the eye, which is the retina. Now, an image here will be seen clearly to the viewer. Now, someone who has myopia or nearsighted, they will have a length of the eye that is typically longer than normal, or the cornea will be a little bit steeper than normal, causing the light to bend more and fall short of the retina. An image viewed here, or seen here by the viewer, will be blurry. If these physical changes uh, continues to occur, this will increase the risk of other eye diseases such as retinal detachments and glaucoma. Physiologic myopia or naturally occurring myopia develops in children sometimes between the ages of five to 10 years old and gradually progresses until the eye is fully grown. Rather than stabilizing, the eye can continue to grow at an abnormal rate and uh, causing or leading to degenerative, degenerative changes. Once the refractive error has reached six diopters or more, or the length of the eye is 26 millimeters or greater, this is now known as myopic degeneration or also known as pathological myopia. So what are the clinical signs? So as the eye stretch and gets thinner, this can create a tessellated fundus, giving a more checkered appearance and allowing the choroidal vessels to be seen more clearly. Common diseases associated with myopia are diabetes, cataract formation, uh, ROP, Ehlers Danlos, Marfan's, the list can go on, right? And also glaucoma. Why glaucoma? Because as the eye uh, stretch, that can cause mechanical stress on the trabecular meshwork, leading to reduced drainage of aqueous humor, causing increase in intraocular pressure. This is a myopic crescent, which is a white crescent area located on the temporal side of the optic disc. Um, this is caused by atrophy of the choroid, allowing the sclera to become more visible. So why is it always on the temporal side here? Because the papillary bundles of nerve fibers are the thinnest on the temporal side. There is also another clinical finding here. Um, I won't let you know what it is as yet, I'll discuss further, but if you have an idea what it is, what it could be, and then just pause this video, think about it, write it down in the comment section below. If you know what it is, that's great. If you're not sure, or if you're like a first year student or a pre optometry student and you're not sure, then that's okay. Just stay tuned and you'll find out. So here we have what is called a posterior staphyloma. Now staphylomas are abnormal pouching or outpouching of the sclera, the white part of the eye. In very high myopia, when the sclera thins and expands further, the sclera can no longer maintain the curvature, the structure of the curvature, and an irregular curvature is formed, giving you a more oblong shape of the eyeball, as you can see here. Now, posterior staphylomas can also be seen with using a B-scan. So you can see the outpouching here and as well over here. Okay, so here we have that mystery clinical sign appearing again. I'm sure you guys thought what this could be. If you guys guessed android streaks, then you are not correct. Come on, this is the lacquer crack. Lacquer cracks, okay? There are ruptures or breaks of the Brooks membrane, usually lo localized in the posterior pole. 
Uh, now, they usually appear as a yellowish white in color and have a more linear or stellate pattern in appearance. When you see a lacquer crack, you need to think about um, compromise to the outer retina because this can also lead to choroidal neovascular membranes, right? That can also be due to a break in the Brooks membrane as well. Now, I'll explain more what our choroidal neovascular membranes are, or I'll just say CNVNs for short. Now, also you have here is a tilted disc, okay? So as the eye stretches, you're going to have that oblique insertion of the optic nerve into the globe. And that's how you see the, like, this is really evident, but sometimes it's not that evident, right, as it starts out. But you can see here, just a clue, I'll give you a hint. Look at the blood vessels. You see how they're stretched or drag along? That's how you know that the, the, the nerve is tilted. So here we have a subretinal hemorrhage. So if a break develops in Brooks membrane, newly sprouted choroidal vessels can enter into the neurosensory retinal space. Because it's so immature and faulty, these vessels can leak fluid, lipid, or even blood. So here you see accumulation of blood in that uh, subretinal space. So with that accumulation of blood or hemorrhage in that subretinal space, that can become pigmented over time. And this is what is called a uh, fugue spot. So you can see here. Essentially what these are is scarring over time. So due to all that stretching and thinning of the retina and choroid, atrophy can develop, giving rise to more sclera being shown. Now if a patient is complaining of central vision loss, you need to suspect other lesions in the retina and conduct a more thorough exam because usually chorirenal atrophy does not involve the central fovea. The main symptom is gradual enlargement of visual field defects. As of now, unfortunately, there is no effective treatment or management for chorirenal atrophy. Again, with all that stretching and pulling of the retina, you can have the vitreous, the posterior vitreous, pull on the retina or have that traction leading to um, the splitting of the retina, what is called macular schesis or foveal schesis, which causes like a more cyst-like formation. These cysts can progress into a partial thickness leading to a full thickness macular hole and eventually a macular detachment. So here we have choroidal neovascular membranes. Anytime you see the CNVM, you need to think of breaks in Brooks membrane. When you have a break in Brooks membrane, you can have newly formed blood vessels originating from the choroid going through that break into the subretinal space and developing a choroidal neovascular network of vessels. But these vessels, they're not strong. They're very weak and prone to breakage, leakage of lipid, fluid, even blood. Now, depending on where uh, these vessels are located, they can appear different in color. So when you see it more like an orangey red in color, that means that it is within the retina or under the retina due to the the transparent nature uh, of the retina. Now, if you see it more darker in color, greenish or even gray, that means that that network, that network is under the RPE layer because you have that melanin of the RPE blocking uh, some of that color. Overall, there is no cure for myopic degeneration. Myopic degeneration is not simply a refractive disorder, so glasses or contact lenses cannot correct for myopic degeneration because there is actual damage to the retina when it's being stretched out. There is no reversal for this actual damage or thinning of the retina. All we can do now is manage some of the serious complications that come with this disease. Uh, so one of them is retinal breaks. So we can use photo uh, coagulation with using a laser. 
So if we have a renal break, we can burn the edge of that break, causing a barrier so that no uh, further breakage or tearing of the retina can occur. So this is like more like a preventative measure. Uh, usually, um, if there is retinal breaks with fluid, right, you don't want to do laser coagulation, right, because that's just going to make it worse. It has fluid in it. You want to do cryotherapy, right? You want to freeze it. So instead of burning, you're just freezing around that break, right, causing um, a barrier again and preventing further breakage or tearing of the retina. If there's no fluid, then you, you can safely do the photocoagulation. Another thing you can do is sclerobuckle. So we're using a piece of silicone to wrap around the eye. Uh, it can close in on the retinal breaks, just closing it up. Another serious complication of myopic degeneration is the choroidal neovascular membrane. So choroidal neovascular membranes in high myopia tends to be smaller and less active than what you'll see in age-related macular degeneration. So here you just have before and after uh, photos um, for the treatment of anti-VEGF. Now, for choroidal neovascular membrane, you can treat this with using the anti-VHRF um, injections, or you can use photodynamic therapy. And what photodynamic therapy is, you're basically injecting a, a drug, a photosynthesizer known as a visudine, injecting that intravenously and using a laser uh, to disactivate that drug. And that can cause a blockage or occluding the vessels so that it won't become uh, prone to leakage. All right, so here just showing the different classifications of that CNVM. So you have extrafoveal, juxtafoveal, and subfoveal. With extrafoveal, so that's basically when you have um, CNVM that is more than 200 microns from the center of the foveal avascular zone. When you have a juxtafoveal that is closer than 200 microns to the center of the foveal um, avascular zone, but it does not involve the center of it. And subfoveal is when you have the foveal avascular zone, the center of it is involved. Now, if you have extra foveal CNVM, you can treat that with laser photocoagulation. With juxtafovia and subfoveal, usually those are more treated with photodynamic therapy or injections with anti-VEGFs. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video and now have a better understanding of myopic degeneration. Please let me know what other ocular disease you are interested in. I will keep that in mind for my next video. Don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe to my channel for more autometry related videos.